Okay. We have 21 people, and I'd like to welcome you to the uh, crop modeling webinar, October 27th. Are we running, Sherry? Yep, we're recording. Okay. I have a set of uh, goals, and really this this webinar is about evaluating the crop model setups, the files, assumptions, even the responsiveness to the CTWN, and that needs to be done to satisfaction before you actually start the impact assessments and adaptations. So we're going to review the what you've done with the overlay and survey and assumptions, discuss the probability of exceedance graphs from the farm survey yields, and show examples from the simulated response to CO2 temperature and nitrogen. Now, what we want to do here, and we've been doing this already, is to identify places where we need one-on-one -on -one interactions with uh, either the DSAT or the Epsim crop modelers. And what I want to say here is that I think this is very important. Those of you who were at the multi-model course two years ago in India and Nepal, uh, we kind of created side sessions to look at the files and that was very important before going forward. So. Uh, Cheryl and I have looked through the DSAT files, and I think the Epsom modelers are doing the same thing with the inputs to run the, the Epsom model. Any, any questions before we go forward? Okay. Um, the first thing that I want to do is to illustrate um, some common issues that we discovered, and that is, uh, first of all, in the survey, soil, and dome entries, we saw a number of cases where this SLCF, standing for course fraction, was filled in with numbers that ranged from 20 to 60. Um, this category is, is not sand, okay? The way the DSAT structure works is that input file is that you input silt and clay and it assumes that sand is by difference so you're not entering it so I'm not sure there's an error because I saw water holding capacities that looked reasonable despite having 50 percent course fraction but that should be an entry that's fixed in those files that the course fraction should be zero unless you truly had larger than two millimeter stone uh, Cheryl and I also looked at this, and we feel that there should roughly be one field overlay per soil, one dome per soil, because soils potentially will have different aspects that will require inputs, either a different uh, residue, a different initialization of nitrogen, water. Um, so that's kind of a generalization. We saw one case where uh, HADAT was entered in the survey file, okay, and that caused the model to run on fixed harvest dates, and that isn't good when you try to challenge it with future climate or uh, temperature change because the model always runs to the same calendar date. So if you do have observed harvest dates, enter that as HDAT, and that means that it goes into what we call the file A as observed data, and it does not change how the model simulation works. Uh, we also saw a number of cases where it seemed to be that you were having multiple entries for the same variable. Um, now, usually you'd have an exclamation point, but sometimes that's not true. And what happens is that the first one controls when you use fill in the dome, but if the second one with the same factor uses replace, then it replaces what was there. So I think we're a little bit concerned about redundant entries, and they actually need to, I suppose this is a track of how you looked at things, but 
just be sure that the last controls and where this occurred is initial conditions for nitrogen as part per million of nitrate or ammonium and then some other cases where it looked like you were trying to enter certain kilos of nitrogen per total soil and the two will give you the same uh, output well they may not if the if the magnitudes are different so you need to know which one is controlling do not use both the same thing applies with the uh, <coughs> the EPSIM approach of uh, uh, F inert. We started initially with this as some multiplier of the SOM3, the century style, um, but there's also an alternate way of doing this now that the EPSIM modelers have done with transpose. So just be sure which one is working. Any questions on that one? Tell controls. Okay. If I don't see a chat box, we'll keep going on it. Okay. We saw some other things about what I would call model concerns a little bit. Um, with the DSAT models uh, for the non legumes, I think I saw some of this fertility factor SLPF that were fairly low, like 0.5. Be careful to go too low on that one. What should be controlling that is what you do to the soil carbon, especially the fraction uh, stable carbon, SOM3. We also saw a few issues with uh, the rice modeling, both with APSIM and DSET, but the series rice model has volatilization if ammonium or, or urea fertilizer is applied and it's not incorporated and you actually can specify the percent volatilized depending on how you you apply it also does denitrification and that can cause what I call very different nitrogen responses that you'll see when we show a CTW and what that may be is that it's run somewhat as an aerobic or alternate wetting and drying. Um, both APSIM DSET models, we found a case where initial condition soil carbon uh, had minus 99s in some slots. That's not acceptable because it actually tries to use it or create some other default. Um, we also saw differences in ET. So I'm expecting differences in response to rainfall, except that it was not that different. So uh, there's something that I think that we need to investigate behind the scenes and verify that the output from APSIM that goes in the ET uh, slot may not may actually be transpiration instead. Um, but I know that the models are different from prior experience on their ET, so we might see differences. Um, another aspect is that you varied uh, initial conditions for either the, the stable carbon, S13, or the fraction inert between the two different models. So if these are not totally coordinated, you could expect different model responses to nitrogen. Comments? Anybody? Uh, it, it's John Dimes here. Can yes. you hear me? Oh, okay. Yes. Um, I just checked that. Yes, the APSIM output is actually uh, transpiration. Ah, that's a, yes. a a good half of the explanation then. Yes. Yes. So we will need to to coordinate. Actually, I would like to have all the models output both transpiration and soil evaporation separately. It would be a good way to verify what we're getting. Yes, that's a that's a good idea too, yeah. Okay, thanks. That that helps explain some of the differences. Yep. Okay, uh, the, the last of what I call common issues discovered and that is that the I've seen some probability of exceedance numbers that did not start at one and it, they have to start at one 
on the left hand side of the axis so we need to discover why at least one or two case examples had something that were, was different. Um, the South African group used historical aggregated district yields and I saw evidence that they should have detrended before actually putting the numbers uh, plotting against probability of exceedance and looking at how the model predicted uh, over you know the yield responses. But that's only for the aggregated district yields. So another case where the difference between drained upper limit and lower limit was about 0.04 and yet there was pretty fair amount of clay and silt in the soil so something had to be done wrong on that soil and I've seen that too many times with the DSAT S build uh, where sand was put into the coarse fraction category. Sand, and coarse fraction basically is non-water holding. It just blocks out that amount of soil that says has no capacity to hold water. Um, we saw, I think, and this is kind of maybe picking on places and Subash said it's real, but high initial nitrate ammonium in a survey file can cause differences in fertilizer response and maybe even differences among models. Um, some of the early runs that you did, the quad UI was not giving a correct CTWN for nitrogen, so there was a nitrogen response that was non-existent. And we may need to rerun some of those with a, a fix to the quad UI. Uh, this goes into a different set of materials and some of this is a little bit new but let's this I've got two or three slides that deal with looking at the survey uh, probability of exceedance this is an old one from the Euro peanut and if you have an observed distribution across farms this blue and you have two different models um, you might say that this model, the red, this is the, the DSAT peanut model, was a little bit low, so what's causing that is the cultivar not described well or not enough water holding capacity or this fertility factor low. The Epsom peanut model had a distribution that was not as wide as the observed, so the question there is, the, is potentially the inputs. Um, because there's a lot of hypothesizing about the uh, characteristics of the soils across the farms for water holding capacity, soil carbon residue, and initial nitrate and ammonium. So what you want is to mimic fairly closely the distribution uh, and the probability of exceedance. Here's a uh, a slide that uh, you see at the top. I don't know if you can see it with my little screen, but we said, what's wrong with this picture? Now this is maize from Clips, and this is chickpea from South India. And just to pick on, in one case, the DSAT model was not responding very much to the occurrences. This is the Epsom chickpea, so we're taking equally picking on both modeling groups. But what causes the lack of variation in the simulated when you're looking at observed that might have a larger distribution like the blue. This is maize. Uh, the Epsim here was picking up distribution. It probably was pretty close, maybe having a little bit of a high productivity aspect that could have brought this down. But what's going on with this? Um, the, likewise with chickpea, what's causing this model is picking up the distribution, this one is not. So what is in the files, the inputs or the model that's causing this and we're not totally sure but if you end up having a, a tail here that is not uh, going low enough uh, then you need to look at what's being done with water holding capacity or initial soil water that might be too high or if it's a nitrogen sensitive plant are you giving too much initial uh, nitrogen availability? Uh, 
the SOM3 or fraction inert. Uh, if you get a tail on the upper end, it potentially is something else. It might say that if your upper end is too low, then the genetic potential may not be high enough in, in this case. Any questions on this one? Okay, I have one question. Yes. Identify yourself. Yeah, I'm Dakshina Murthy. Yeah, uh, Dennis. Oh, I'm, uh, just, I'm regarding the chickpeas out in here. I have a question. <laughs> Go ahead. What's your question? Uh, yeah. See, like, uh, if you want to change the methyl uh, water and nitrogen, I try to do that. But, uh, at the time, what happens is that my heat assimilations are going on. So, so it, right now the these assimilations are doing good. But if I uh, change all the initial water and initial nitrogen and other changes, the these assimilations also going wrong. Oh, so you're getting a differential response between two models depending on what you do with initial conditions? Yes. Yes. I think that I would say deal with the individual DSAT and Epsom folks and try to understand with them what's going on. Okay. Connect connect with them. I, I'm not okay. sure I can give you a good answer without you know. I saw a chat box that said, what is the range of SLPF? Um, in my experience, we have not gone much below about 0.7 for the grain legumes throughout Africa and India. And the series maize model really shouldn't go that low either. It really needs to be that if you have to go lower than that, it's that you have issues with your soil carbon nitrogen mineralization. Um, and, and for most of Ghana, we've actually gone between 0.8 to 0.9. Let me keep going here. Okay, this is Cheryl. Cheryl, do you want to take over? I'll, I'll, I'll advance it, but you go with the discussion. Okay. So I just have um, about four slides here on some of the dome functions and what they do. Um, and there are a number of dome functions. These are means of um, supplying information that you don't have in the survey data. Um, you, they're all documented on research.agmip.org. Go ahead and go forward, Ken. Okay. Sorry. What is going yes. on? Yeah, so actually that's where I wanted to get to. <laughs> so research.agmip.org, and then you can just type dome into the search and the first hit is where it will take you to the page where all of these functions are documented. Okay, next slide. Everybody using that? Good. Okay, so the root distribution function is useful to distribute roots in the soil for uh, DSAT requires that distribution in the soil file. But it's not just for roots either. You can use this to distribute other things through the soil profile, such as organic carbon, which somewhat mimics the shape of the root distribution. And that's not a coincidence. Um, nitrogen sometimes can take that shape too. So this is a useful function. So the inputs are that you give the value in the topsoil. Um, and in this case, um, it looks like I, I put this together in a hurry yesterday, and my values don't match the graph. The, you can see that the value in the topsoil in this case is about 5. The topsoil depth is um, about 20. And the depth at which the value goes to 2% of the value in the topsoil is the third input. And in this case, it's at 180. So what it does is it maintains that value in the topsoil for the entire depth of the topsoil, and then it produces this exponential decay um, down to depth. So it's just it, it's just a useful function that, that gives you that shape. So think of this as percent organic matter might be a good number, you know, between 1.5 to 5. Okay, so that's that's what the root distribution function does. And then next slide. Okay, coming. 
And then this is related. This is a stable C function. And so it works on the total organic carbon that you may have used the previous function to distribute. So you can see that is the blue line um, in the left graph is the total carbon. And what this does is it calculates the stable carbon, you know, using the same units as total organic carbon. So the units here are grams carbon per 100 grams of soil. Okay, so it's a percent by weight of soil. Okay, so the inputs are that you give the SOM3 fraction at the surface. So we we're saying in this case it's 65% of the total carbon. Uh, our topsoil depth is 20, and the depth of soil at which the SOM3 is 98% of the total is 180. And what it does then is it breaks out that um, stable carbon um, as a function of the total organic carbon. So the right-hand graph shows you what that fraction is. So it goes from a fraction of 0.65 to 0.98 at the bottom. Cheryl, so, can I make a comment here? Sure. The, the assumption in a lot of the work with the stable carbon is that deep soil organic carbon is 98%. That's why you almost have that locked there. That's right, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this is one way to do your stable carbon, and you could you could use this, I think, and I'll let the APSIM people correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you could use a curve like this for your inert carbon as well. They wouldn't want 98% at the bottom, but it, if you could almost make that flexible. Um, yeah, no, we tend to use 0.99 at, at the deeper layers in APSIM for F inert. Okay. Is soil organic SOM3, does it partici uh, contribute to mineralization? Yes, it does. This but is very okay. slowly. Approach. Okay, well, the F inert function in, or portion in APSIM does not contribute to mineralization. Yeah, that's right. They're related, but they're not the same. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're different. Yep. But I think that your inert carbon could be distributed in, in a similar way. Yes, yeah, so I'll talk to you. Uh, when my, uh, my slides come up, I'll, I'll make a comment about that, how okay. we do it. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, so um, next slide. Yeah. All right, these are just an, another uh, three functions that I'm going to mention. The first one is a layer set function, and this splits soil layers into thicknesses that are more appropriate for our um, drainage models that we have in both DSET and APSIM. If you have very thick soil layers, you might want to use this to um, split the layers, and what it does is it tries to split layers um, into homogeneous, it tries to do as little mixing as possible. But at the top, it's going to split the top two layers into five and uh, ten centimeter thicknesses. And then below that, it's going to try to just take a thick layer and split it into two, three, or four layers. So um, DSET does some of this internally, so it's not quite as important for DSET. But if you've got very thick layers, you might want to use a function like this um, before you run any of the other functions on soil type um, functions. And then the alternative is this transpose function. And basically, you're just inputting the absolute values that you want for a particular soil variable. And it puts them into each layer. So that's if you want to very precisely control your inputs. You would use the transpose function. And then there is a pitot transfer function. It's called PTCalc. It's based on Saxton and Rawls. Um, that's where, with known uh, soil texture and organic carbon, um, it will calculate your drained upper limit, lower limit, SAT, and so on. OK? Any yeah. questions on the dome functions? Because that's all I have to say about that. Cheryl, Sean Hargreaves here. Hi, John. Hi. Um, layer set. Um, five millimeters is, I think, too thin for the topsoil in Apsim. 
it'll dry out too quickly. Did I say millimeters? It, it's centimeters. Sorry, you're five centimeters. My mistake. Okay. Um, you know, I, I have mentioned this to John Dines, but um, I forget what his response was. I think 10 should, should be the minimum that we would use in AppSim. So is there a way of controlling that? Right now, no. Um, we could change the function, but right now the way the function uses it, it takes the top two layers are going to be 5 and 10 centimeters. Even if yeah, the I, folks create their own layers, Cheryl? Well, if you want to create your own layers, you don't need this at all. Yeah. Right? I mean, you could do the, you could split your layers manually. So, so John, what you're saying, though, is that this function isn't, we, we actually built this for AppSim, so if it's not useful for AppSim, we should reconsider how we're doing it. Yeah, I remember doing that with you, and it's uh, good work. But um, I have since fa or had issues with the five centimeter top layer. Uh, I forget exactly what the problem was, but it, it was drying out too quickly, and that caused caused something to go wrong. It might have been just germination or emergence or something like that. Okay. Well, I'll, I'm going to make a note to follow up with you on that. Okay. Thanks. Um, John John Dimes here speaking. Um, in my PhD work, I did use a 0 to 5, and I've used AppSim to simulate 0 to 5. The issue comes about with the uh, interaction with the water balance routines. That, yeah, it dries out too quickly, but the critical uh, term then becomes the unsaturated flow parameters as to whether it can transfer more water into that evaporative layer quick enough. So there's, there's an interaction between layer depth and water flow in the soil profile as to what might happen. So I, I like 0 to 5 because that's where all the carbon is, all the organic matter is, and, and therefore you get a better uh, description of your soil nitrogen um, supply routines. But 0 to 10, I would recommend 0 to 10, 10 to 15 sort of thing, uh, 10 to 20 rather, as the top two layers. Okay. All right, I, we can do that pretty easily if that's more appropriate. And then the maximum uh, layer thickness we tend to like to see is 30 uh, centimeters. Okay. So what you do with this would not change the DSAT. The DSAT would still break it up 0, 0.5. Yep. That's okay. what happens. It does after mm -hmm. the fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's not going to affect DSAT. It would not affect DSAT significantly. Okay. I'd like to go to to John Dimes. This is this is his set of three slides. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, th these slides I put together when I was at the Zimbabwe workshop at Vic Falls. Um, a number of issues came up with the neuro um, simulations, and having looked at um, other location, other regional uh, AppSim file inputs in the last few days. I think these same sorts of errors are being consistently being made with the AppSim input. And so I, I thought I'd just run through them once again. Uh, there's three, three slides highlighting the AppSim input screens uh, and the soil parameters that I'm talking about. Um, on this first screen, we're talking about, in the first instance, the air dry input parameter. Actually, this has got no real consequence on simulated results. But you can see the, um, the dashed line in the graph below. That represents the air dry values relative to the lower limit for crops or LL15 values. And we just shouldn't see that sort of setup. So my comment is that the air dry values below 30 centimetres should be made equal to the LL15 values. Ah. Okay. okay. It, it, because below the 50 centimetres, we believe that any soil drying is actually via root uptake in seasonal rainfall situations. So it's, it doesn't, I don't think it will have any impact on any simulated results greatly. It might if you're simulating from season to season and you're looking at carryover effects, but otherwise not. But it's just, uh, it doesn't look right, and so I'm, I'm, that's why I'm commenting on it. The more pertinent error on this particular page is the XF value. 
Uh, we had long discussions about this and email conversations. Many of the AppSim files that we were looking at in the last few days still have values of 0 and 0.1 in the soil layers for XF and that effectively turns off any water uptake or nutrient uptake from those layers. Um, and the XF value is actually to specify a chemical or physical limitation on root growth. And otherwise we say that all the roots will grow into all the layers effectively for uptake purposes. So unless you know that there's a chemical or physical limitation in a layer, XF should be input as one. Um, so a, a lot of the AppSim runs need to be fixed up and, and basically that XF variable in AppSim was being initialized from one of the dome or quad UI outputs uh, using the root distribution of dissat, I think it is. Yeah, they, they and, conflict with each other from what they, I They can... conflict, yes. Uh, and, and so the AppSim modelers need to go through and manually set this value to 1 as I understand it because the the automatic setups is putting these sorts of values that we see on the screen into into those boxes. So what if the group in uh, Neuro said they had a physical impedance layer at 30 or say 40 centimeters what would they do? They need well, they to could put, set, they would set the one one above the top two layers would be 1 and then they'd put 0.5 in that 40 to 60 centimeter layer, and then it would revert to one in the lower layers. Okay. You have papers that describe how they should parameterize that. Um, <laughs> you'd have to go back to our 1996 paper, Probit et al. I think. Yeah. I think that the DSAT embodies both characteristics. It does affect, it does use the physical limitation idea, but it also has a, a root probability for the crop even if it's in a good soil. So yeah. it, it combines both aspects. Well, we, we sort of think that the root uh, distribution is, is captured by putting in the crop lower limit. Yep. Ah, yeah. that's a conflict too. <laughs> yeah. John, it's Perry here. Just to, can I make a quick comment on, on sure. two things? You, you've also got the KL factor there as well. Now, it's not something you'd want to play with, but if you know that there's less roots in a particular layer, um, you could reduce your KL. But as, as John said, the, you really it's your lower limit there. You'd actually reduce your lower limit or in the, yeah, the amount of available water in that, that layer. Um, and John, I just, and Ken, sorry, I just want to make one other comment on John's. Um, this, uh, he was talking about uh, the air dry value. There is an issue if you don't have the lower air dry values um, the same as LL15, if you've got your diffusivities wrong. And I've noticed there's been some diffusivities that are set as if they're sands. So it is possible given enough time to dry out your profile deep enough to the point mm. where it's far below the lower limit of the crop. And so it will affect, uh, it'll take a lot more water to actually wet up the soil um, at that depth. Now that might be possible and it happens in deep sands, but it's, it's not something we see in a lot of our cropping soils. Yeah, no, that's probably right, Perry. I hadn't thought of that, yeah. John Hargreaves here. I'd just like to go back to the KL. Um, from the soils I, I've seen in the databases, in the AppSim soils databases, usually KL reduces with depth. And yeah. that reflects. Hmm? Yeah, no, I think you're right. I just noticed these are all 0.06s. Yeah. yeah. Because that also reflects the root length density. Root length density, yep. yep. So does KL affect nu nutrient uptake as well? Uh, the nutrient uptake is taken with the water flow, so yes, okay. it will. So KL yeah. does affect it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Next slide. Yep. 
Next slide. Yeah, you've got it. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. Um, now, this here is the, if you look on the left-hand side, this is the soil water node in the APSIM setup. Um, just talking about the green circle areas first, what I've noticed is that some mod, uh, users um, are setting up the soil parameters with inconsistencies given the and so on the previous page, the bulk densities were about 1.4 to 1.35 or something. And here we have the diffusivity constants in the green circle on the left, and the green circle on the right is the SW con, the soil drainage property. And it's, but all of those variables reflect a common soil texture, in this case, a, a sandy loam, and there's consistency. But a lot of the setups that I've seen is that the bulk densities will be incompatible with the SW con in particular, or the diffusivities. For example, I've put an example there, a bulk density of 1.6 and an SW con of 0.7 are consistent with a sandy soil. But then you might have diffusivities of 40 and 16 which represent a heavy clay. And so there's, tends, there's been this tendency to have incompatibilities given the soil texture uh, of the soil being described. So just be aware that you should have those consistencies um, give, given knowledge about the soil texture properties. The, the more critical um, inputs here are the evaporation coefficients, Kona and U, and then the runoff curve number, the bare soil runoff curve number. Uh, in the tropics, our experience is that, or my experience I should say, is that the curve number needs to be greater than 80 to reflect the high intensity rainstorms typical in this environment. And this, this sort of value comes from the work by KPC Rao at Patton Sharu in India and Georgia Quash at Katamani in Kenya who conducted uh, runoff experiments. And um, in Patton Sharu in particular, I was very surprised that KPC Rao had calibrated curve numbers of greater than 90 for an alfisol soil. Um, so in the tropical environments, I don't like to see something less than 80. So that's just a, a comment there on the curve numbers. I've, see, I've been seeing values of 60 and 70, 75 in, in a lot of the input files. Um, the other thing then is the, um, the Kona variables. Um, I like to reverse the, the, the typical values are something high for you, and then a lower value, 3.5, is the consistent, the universal value for Kona. But uh, my experience with soil, simulating soil nitrogen dynamics suggests that we need to reverse those parameters uh, for two reasons. One, because we get a better uh, min mineralized simulation of the mineralization potential in the surface layers, and also the long-term drying, uh, extensive drying into the profile if you have a very low value of Kona, then that limits long-term drying. And so dry spells and the effect on the water balance are not well captured, having values of um, three and a half. And there's some uh, references there that uh, John Hargrave shared with me the other day that sort of gives some more supporting evidence that why those values should be reversed. So any, any comments? Uh, John, this is Ken. Um, I think maybe Cheryl and I need to go back and verify where the teams are coming up with their values for the SWCon and uh, those things because some may be coming out of the PEDO transfer function, uh, others may be uh, things that EPSIM modelers are expected to find from EPSIM users. See, we, we don't. Yeah, these are almost 100% coming from the, the field overlay dome. So these are values that, um, you know, they need to look at and, and see what's appropriate for their regional conditions, the soils that are present and so on. But I, I have a feeling that in a lot of cases, um, people don't know what to put there. And so right. they just leave the values that were in the template. The only ones yeah. that come out of the pedo transfer function are bulk density and SW con, if they've done a that. Well, where curve does number, the curve, well, curve, number, curve number come from? 
Repeat, please. Uh, where does the curve number, where is it generated? How uh, does it, that come about? It is something in the pitot transfer function or if they use the S build in the DSAT. Bulk density, <laughs> SW con, and curve number yeah. would be outcomes. Okay. Well, but, I, I, my experience with APSIM in the tropics is that 60, values of 60 are just too low. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't say that all of those came from the pitot transfer function either, but I, I think yeah. we need to investigate where some of the others can be derived more correctly. Mm. I mean, if we, one of the things we could do is come up with some algorithms that we could put in the dome. It, you know, if that's appropriate, let's let's develop those. At one time, Joe Ritchie had an improvement on runoff curve number based upon rainfall intensity for regions, which is, well, we've never implemented it, but it might allow the heavy tropical rainfall to give a different runoff number. Yeah, I think yeah. for now, though, the teams are pretty much stuck with, you know, thinking about their conditions, thinking about what, you know, what occurs in their regions and coming up with a reasonable value from the literature. I, I think at this point, what I would do is to challenge the APSIM DESA APS modelers to go back and help improve the numbers they use for their specific soils just so they can go forward with it. Yeah. J just to add on to what Cher Cheryl's suggestion is, the other thing you, the model users can do is look at the um, the components of the water balance and just check what proportions are going into runoff, what proportions going into transpiration, evaporation, etc. Uh, soil evaporation, that is, um, because the runoff, if the the runoff is too low, if it's only less than 10%, then you probably that's a signal that you need to increase the curve number, um, and if it's above 40 percent then perhaps it's too high. So there's some rules like that as well. Just look at the components of the water balance outputs to get a feel as whether the curve number is giving an expected range of say 15 to 30 percent of runoff, or 15 to 25 percent, on an annual basis that is. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, so if there's any other questions before we go to the last slide? Okay, here's the next slide. So, so, yeah, move to the next slide, Ken, please. Okay. Now, now this here is the soil organic matter. Oops, oh, sorry. Somebody wants to ask a question? I think you're getting no. echo. Oh, I beg your pardon. Okay. Uh, I don't know what to do about that. Uh, <laughs> on this slide, we're looking at the soil organic matter inputs uh, for the APSIM. Um, and the first circle highlights the uh, inputs profile. This is just an initial condition. Caesar, Caesar is talking. I, I think we need everybody to mute. Mute the microphone if you're not talking. Okay. Okay. Um, so the first red circle on the left-hand side is about the uh, initialization of the group. Is there a problem my end here or what? The, Is everything okay? It sounds good now, John. All right. Yeah, you're good. Uh, so just good. a comment yes. on the route. Well, please. So a comment on the routes. Um, I noticed that up to a thousand kilograms of, of root weight has been put into some of the APSIM runs and I'm just drawing attention to the fact that that will influence fairly strongly the amount of mineralization of nitrogen in the profile, especially when the CN ratio is 45 to 1, as in this example. Um, and 
you can actually do a, you know, some simulation runs and then look at the amount of roots in AppSim to get a, a better feel for what the amount of roots should be initialized at. For example, in this example, the average simulated roots for unfertilized maize at this particular site was 350 kilograms, although the CN ratio output by the model was 48 to 1, and that's pretty close to what was being used. But I'm just drawing your attention to the fact that those initial root levels, if they're 1,000 kilograms, it's going to be influencing your nitrogen supply. So that's one comment. The more critical aspect of this slide is the inputs for F biome and F inert. Um, there should be a similar distribution to the soil organic carbon in terms of F biome. And that means it should be the highest in the surface and lowest at the bottom layer. And in all the APSIM input files that I've been seeing in the AGMIP exercises, it's the reverse. And I think that's coming from an error somewhere in the dome overlays. And my point here is that the users have to manually go in and re-put re in these values to make the distribution look more attuned to what I'm suggesting. So typically 0.03 in the surface layer down to 0.01 in the bottom layers. Uh, if you've got an enriched soil, if, the, if you've just come out of a legume, lay, a legume phase, then maybe it might be 0.04. And if it's a degraded soil, then I'm suggesting 0.02. And then it reduces to 0.01 in the lower layers. In the inputs that I've been looking at, it's been 0.03 in the surface and up to 11% in the bottom layers. And that's the reverse to what we would expect. So the users need to inspect that manually. And if it's if the distribution is high in the bottom layers, then we manually go in and change it so that it's more in tune to what we're expecting it to be. Uh, similarly then with the F inert, uh, at the surface it can be based on the proportional relationship of the top and bottom soil organic carbon contents. So if you look at the F uh, organic carbon levels in the surface, it's 0.648. And in the bottom layer, it's 0.32. So the way we think about this is that the levels of carbon, the soil organic carbon in the lowest layer, represents the recalcitrant level um, carbon in the soil profile over time. And so if you extrapolate that proportionally to the surface layer, then it's about 0.5. So our values for F inert in this instance would be 0.5 in the surface layer and then increasing with depth to 0.99 in the bottom layer. So that's a little bit different. Um, I noticed that the F SOM3 levels in DISAT are 60 and 70 percent in the surface layer. And uh, I guess that's a different form of carbon, so I guess that's OK. Actually, John, it, it depends on the soils. If you have a highly degraded soil, you can start out with SOM3 at 0.98 at the surface. So it, it really depends on the soils and the, um, the management history. Yeah, it, it will up to a point, but the, the, the crops are growing in that soil and turning over carbon through the root system and residue inputs. And so it's, it's probably not going to be that high. It would be a highly, highly degraded soil to be 0.98 in the surface. I agree with John on that one. Uh, we need to investigate the function that's been used for this. Uh, so, Sorry, I couldn't hear that, Ken. There was uh, uh, we need to investigate what function has been used for the F biome. I mean, it, it could be an interpretation that it's acting like F inert or Ah, yes. Okay, yes, that's right, because it's been initialized from the dome set up with values increasing with depth. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen the transpose function used for that, so with, you just need to connect with everybody that's doing a file. Yeah. Ken, there's a couple of questions in the chat from uh, Dakshina Murthy. Yes. Let me word one of these. Dashina asked, can we use a formula for summer U and Kona inputs? John Dimes. Um, yeah, no, I, 
I, I, I referred to the references in the pr uh, previous slide. Um, I don't know of any myself, uh, but those papers would have some enlightenments for the, the questioner. Okay. Uh, so on, the previous slide, on the previous slide, there are some references that have been listed. Okay. Dasheen asked another question too, and that he had he's trying to calculate U based upon clay and sand. It's a little too complicated to try to give equation over the uh, verbally, but did do you see his text box, John? No, I don't. Uh, I don't okay. see it. I yeah, think okay. it's detailed for us to go into. Dashina, why don't you send the, the Epsom folks the the question separately. Okay, actually I saw that one in uh, AppSim support group that somebody has given this formula so that we can use U and uh, based on the soil silt and clay condition. Okay. And what sort of values does it come up with for you? Yeah, that's what you, you asked me to change. I calculated based on this formula, it's coming around 7.5 and uh, 6, but you asked me to change to 3 and 4.5, so I changed according to you. Yeah, because the 7.5 for you, um, I just don't think that the soil hydraulic properties can keep up with that level of evaporation myself in tropical conditions. Okay. It's Peter Thorburn here. Maybe you could um, send us the, the details. Um, the formula. I mean, you've given it in the chat box there, but the you know, person who supplied it to you, something, something like that, so we could follow it up a bit more. Yeah, I like that. Um, we're about 8:52. I guess we could potentially go longer than that. Uh, I have uh, some of the CTWN exercises that I could show. So Ken, we, since time is short, I'm, we've had correspondence with most of the teams by email prior to this webinar, but I wonder if there are questions that people want to ask us in the time remaining about their inputs. Chat box or, or live. Yeah, hello. Hello, Dillis. Yeah, I, I think part of the challenge we have is that uh, the survey information that we are trying to model do not actually do it the soil input data we are using. So it becomes a bit challenging trying to simulate uh, see, uh, how it the observe is. So when we try all that, we feel, I mean, there's no way it can be done. That's why we come out with some of those uh, inputs. So I don't know how best we can even handle this because every group of people would handle it differently. And at times it becomes a bit frustrating when you have to do it over and over again. So I want to have maybe a thought on that. Dillis, I'm sorry, I, I had a well very enough. hard time hearing. Yeah. Ken, did you catch the question? No, I did not. Really, if you can type it in a chat box, I don't know if that works. Can I try it again? Can you, can you put the, do you have a chat box with the community? Type it in the, in the bottom of the chat box where it's called enter your message. I've got one slide in here that I, 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 what I say is that those of you who have individual questions, we would anticipate direct connection with the DSAT EPSIM modelers um, because I think at this point the, the experts with the uh, EPSIM DSAT have looked at your files and need to give feedback directly. Um, let me make one other comment before we, we go away from this, and this is to introduce what I consider to be the longer term perspective of the CTWN analysis. I think we still need to do a joint paper 
Um, we need the multiple teams doing CTWN on, on, we have multiple different crops, maize, wheat, rice, uh, chickpea, and what's really important there is that the EPSIM and DESA experts interpret reasons for why the models are different, also considering that your inputs on soil water and soil nitrogen are done correctly and that there's not a translator issue. So uh, we want to pursue this. I don't know if we'll have time to show some of the visuals or not. Um, so Dillies, okay. Can you repeat your question in the chat box? Oh, that's Cheryl's comment to her. I don't believe Dillies has found that. That box. Can can isn't isn't the issue here that at this point in time the CTWN analysis results are not very relevant until we have established that the inputs for the DISAT and the APSIM applications are correct. I and think that's mostly, mostly true. I think that in some cases, though, it is informing us as to what and why we might be having problems. Okay? Yeah, okay. Yep. Uh, so I'd, I'd say that it's not totally off the, the stream. Let me, let me just show a couple here. Okay. Um, I don't know how long we're allowed to go, but this, this is the CLIPS team. And the CLIPS team uh, had response to CO2 for maize at low nitrogen or high nitrogen. And for whatever reason, and, and this may be an issue with a translator, there's no difference in the DSAT yield level at low or high nitrogen. So something in here, this may be an early step. I'll, I'll drop ahead to nitrogen response, for example. Okay, here's nitrogen response for the DSAT, and this is for EPSIM, and no response above 30. And we need to investigate as to whether there's a problem in the CTWN translator feeding the nitrogen, except that there's a little response here, or whether there's total water limitation, and I believe we looked at that, and it's not as bad either, because here's response to rainfall, and at 100%, there's not much more response to rainfall either. So one other thing that we saw, this is, this is just different. This is the temperature response for minus 2 to plus 8. And both the models are giving a declining yield level, the temperature. So in this case, I know I'm going fast with this, but the example with nitrogen response says we need to dig into what's going on that limits nitrogen response. Did we get an answer from Dillies? Ah, okay. I'll end the show on that one. I'm going to try to word Dillies' question, okay? Dilly said, the soil data we use are normally not from the fields from which the observed yield, survey yield data come from. This actually makes setting of the parameters frustrating as different sets of people will handle things differently. I think Dillis is 100% correct. <laughs> yep. And, uh, but you need experts to make a statement that a farmer's fields are likely to be less fertile than an experimental field. Now, how do you come up with that qualitative judgment? But yes. But the observed yields are coming from farmers' fields. That's correct. Yeah. And I think that if you are not mimicking a low yield, then you may be presuming that, ah, the farmer has a soil that has more problems than your experimental soil, either water or soil carbon, nitrogen. This is the issue with trying to pick up on the, the. Um, oh, okay. So, so the soil data may be coming from experimental plots. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. But I thought the soil data was coming from field, farmers' fields as well. Well, let's put it this way, John. It comes from a farmer field only in the sense of a grid point that you may yes. go to a soil map. Yes, okay. And that grid point does not do a good job of providing all of the detailed things that you just described for, you know, colony yeah. diffusivity and, and, and that. So they're having to, to, to guess. Yeah. Uh, what I think this, the conclusion should be is that they should describe the farmer soils to you and, and, and you come back with a, a range that's reasonable for those parameters. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the um, farm survey data, trying to fit a, a, a simulated curve to the farm survey data is always going to be frustrating. Yeah. Because if you get it right, it's coincidence, and if you <laughs> don't get it right, you have no way of interpreting why not. I, I agree with you there, but remember that John Antle is only using the change ratio. And yeah. what I would say is that we would like to mimic the range of fertility that's out there in the farmer fields and water holding capacity. So I would say we still, even though they weren't fussing about microcalibration, I think some calibration to improve the probability of exceedance curves is, at least it's reasonable. Yeah, one, one complication I have though is that then we extrapolate to the CTWN analysis yep. and we take one farmer's management as the basis for that and then that ignores the, the influence of the management on those distribution curves. And so, yeah, how do we solve that? Do we do these at all? <laughs> We're trying to make it easy by having yeah. one field. And uh, at one time we were saying, oh, pick where the yields for the two models are similar. And I've been discussing with Cheryl to say that might not be a good idea. If the model, one is high and one is low, you're picking the oddball cases to make them come up similar. Yeah, yeah. And I don't like that either. Yeah. So yeah. the median field in the observe might be the best one to, to latch on to. Yes. Um, Sherry said we have time to go beyond an hour if you want to do this. I think, I think it'd still be useful to take about 10, 15 minutes for me to put up the CTWNs and I'll totally go along with the philosophy that these are not finished and we'll see things that are not reasonable. Yeah. Um, the other site that had, no, that's not the one I want. Pakistan. Ah, I know what it is. It's one, this one. Okay. Suwara had also maize. And what I wanted to show from Suwara, now, uh, before we get into this, these are their probability of exceedance curves, and they look generally pretty good. Yeah, I thought they did too. <laughs> yeah. There are two models here that you could say, okay, in this case, the APSIM for peanut is a little bit high, so it's a mean productivity that can come down. The DSTAT for sorghum is a little bit high, and it's mean productivity, genetics or something. But that's actually pretty good. Mm. Uh, here is the CO2 sensitivity for maize, and APSIM is in red. Blue is a DSAT, pretty low yields, but less response under low nitrogen, which is left, uh, higher response. Is this for maize, Ken, or is it for yes. some this other? This is maize. Which crop is It is maize, okay. It is maize, okay. So yep. that is what you would expect, is very small response. Hmm. And, and even under the high nitrogen, the slopes on the two models are relatively similar. If you were to go a percent increase here from 360 to 720, hmm, less than, you know, 7%. So I, I'm fine with this. Uh, here's temperature response. Now, uh, this is the DSAT. 
and this is EPSIM, there, I think we need to go back and look at how CTWN worked here because the prior plot from CLIPS showed that EPSIM showed a curvature with temperature rise yeah. and something is unusual here. That, that's all I could, could say about it. Mm -hmm. so it well, on the other hand, Ken, uh, is the temperature effect in DES, DISAT overly responsive? I, I tend to agree with you with that. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you why I think it is. Uh, Jim and I reset DSAT on this thing called RG fill to 27 degree mean to go to zero at 35. We did that based on rice and sorghum data for yield response. Now, I think that's correct. What we haven't changed yet is that I believe that the model totally overdoes the acceleration of grain filling with the heat units. Hmm. So it's, it's uh, Joe may have had it correct, but for the wrong reason. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So I think that if we go back and fix up the, the uh, rate of progress uh, during grain fill for the phenology, then this curve is going to come back up. Hmm. So I would agree with you that the, right now the, the, the DSAT maze model is too sensitive to temperature. But I still don't like a linear response and then a drop down. So there's something, it's different from CLIPS. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, here's the rainfall sensitivity for the two models. And this is in uh, Suara. And what it's showing, it's interesting. It says more rainfall creates nitrogen leaching and lower production, and both models do the same. Yep. And I think the rainfall at, 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 at this site, uh, oh, okay, this is not uh, Nuro, this is Navrongo. And the rainfall in this season was running about 1,100 millimeters over six months. Yeah. And I think the soils are quite shallow. The descriptions are only 60 centimeters or something. Yeah. Mm. So in this case, yeah, both models are doing the same, but I'm not sure it says we're right. Uh, here's nitrogen response at Navrongo. And in this case, both models seem to be parameterized pretty well for their initial. I think that they know that the yields are running around 600 or so. This is not a linear zeros down here, but they show pretty well the same response. Yeah. What, Ken, why would um, this have a... Have a question. A, yeah, go, go ahead, Gary. Sorry, John. Ken, go back to the previous slide and have a look at the legend. Which one? Temperature? T go back one slide. Rainfall sensitivity, but your legend since T max T mean, I assume that's an error. Oh yeah, I see. Mm. I, I think uh, that's uh, just a bug in the legend. Ah, uh, right, right. No, I'm pretty sure it's rainfall on the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, Sorry. all the legends have T max T min on them. Well, not everyone, but <laughs> no. I think it's an error. Okay. Mm. Sorry. Where's the error in Cheryl? Is it in a graphics program? Um, I'm not sure if they ran ran this. Yeah, this is in the the R script. Ah, but, yeah, we can, we can R script it. error. R is great, but you can make errors faster too. <laughs> okay. Um, 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 so my question here, Ken, is why why have we got a strong nitrogen response in this in this case, but or and in Napsium actually, yes. whereas in the this example, there is no response. That's what I wonder about, and it depends. Cheryl, can you explain the statement you made earlier about the nitrogen sensitivity not working in one of the early CTWNs? Um, yeah. So the the version of the CTWN program that um, actually it's the translator. I think it worked fine for APSIM, but for DSAT there was a bug where it was feeding the same nitrogen to the model every time. Uh, okay, so Meng's, Meng's here too. He's, he thinks it was for both models. So 
in that version that people were using at um, in Victoria Falls, there nobody got nitrogen sensitivity. So we fixed that now. So but yeah. if you're if you're still using an older version of Quad UI, you may see that like lack of nitrogen sensitivity as being a bug in the translator and not actually a model response. So guess what we're testing here? We're testing whether the translator is right, whether the model is right, whether the inputs are right. But yeah. um, we we went and reran some of these um, for the the Pakistan team. We ran reran that here using the latest Quad UI, and there is a response, whereas there was not in their original submission. Okay. I'm going to jump ahead and show you another set. Uh, if I can get the PowerPoint to go. This is uh, the uh, uh, IGB group, and both IGB and Pakistan did rice and wheat. And there were some, I think, some interesting contrast there. Um, in this case, this is the CO2 response on the left under 30 kilos of N, and on the right under 180 kilos of N. Um, one of the things that you'll note here is, mm. is that the DSAT wheat model shows the same yield level under 30 and 180 kilos of N, which is another interesting issue except that they had very high initial nitrate and ammonium in the soil. Um, response surface wise, the EPSIM model showing a little less response under low end compared to high end and I think that's approximately correct. Can, can the R script be written so that that scale on the Y axis is kept constant? Uh, otherwise it confusing as you look from one to the other. You mean the, the, additional little, the, the additional little uh, asterisk or, or uh, do you call it the hash bar at the bottom? No, no, the, the, the y-axis has different scale. Ah, and yes, yes. So that the R script be. should be written so that it keeps it constant. So all five graphs should have exactly the same scale. I would prefer that. If, yeah. if you're trying to contrast the nitrogen levels on CO2 response, then the answer is yes. Yeah. Most teams did not go this far to create in one visual. Good point. Okay. Uh, here's temperature response with the two models. And in this case, uh, EPSIM is a little more sensitive to temperature than the DSAT wheat model. but. I think both of those are quite reasonable. Um, here's the rainfall response, but we'll ignore that because this is an irrigated field. Yeah. Okay. And here's the nitrogen response. Uh, this is the top one is the DSAT, and the bottom one is EPSIM. And for some reason, the, the DSAT is responding much more to the high initial nitrate ammonium in the initial conditions than the EPSIM model does. So that's wheat. This is rice. I don't understand why the, why is the DSAT offset relative to the EPSIM? It has higher leaf area index. Uh, this could be the this could be an error. Okay, again we need to uh, fix. It. This is the case where the which group used the fixed harvest date, Cheryl? But but is in, in shouldn't the the two bars sets of bars line up on the nitrogen application? You mean coming together? Well, uh, maybe they've been offset purposely so that they don't overlap, I see. I oh, think. the offset left to right is, okay, yeah. this is zero and this is zero, okay? Okay, okay. Yep. You just did yep. that so they could put two parallels. Yeah. Okay, okay, I've got to. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> um, no, there was the other location, Pakistan, that had the fixed harvest date. So I, I, I'd say that the models are responding differently to initial nitrogen ammonium. 
what you see yeah. is the rice models give exactly the opposite response here. Hmm. This is Apsam Ariza response to CO2 at low nitrogen and at 180 kilos. And here, the series rice model shows uh, this much lower yield despite having high initial nitrate ammonium mm. fertilized. Now, somewhat correctly, this model has a lower response under low nitrogen than under high nitrogen. So uh, here's the temperature response. Uh, Ariza has, at least the old version, has pretty good temperature sensitivity, and this is the series rice. I would, th I'd say that they are approximately correct. Mm. Here's rainfall, and this one is where it's irrigated, paddy. So, the series rice model says flat, no response to rainfall. The upsim is a little bit water limited if the rainfall is reduced. So something is, it's not a true paddy. I think we discussed that earlier. Mm. Uh, so we, this could be a case of the connection with the quad UI and the translation. Uh, Ken, it's Perry here. Can I just make a comment? Yes. Um, we talked about this earlier. I did have a bit of a look at um, the AppSim setup there. One of the issues is that um, I'm not sure where you're setting Max Pond in the simulation. Um, because the, the one I had a look at, and I only looked at one example, um, Max Pond's not turned on, so there is actually no way Apsim will pond water above the surface unless you turn that on. Ah. So essentially you've been running a dry land situation. So this is a dry land and that's why it's responding that way. Yeah, it's, okay. all, all you're doing is looking at a, an upland irrigated <laughs> rice system, so it's not a, ponded, not a true ponded system. Okay, so we need to figure out how to. I don't know. Yeah, we need to figure out how to um, change that in the AppSim translator. So okay. it's the Patty function that's not working correctly in AppSim yet. So we we'll need to work with Dean on that, I presume. Well, it's it's yeah. in there. You can you can turn it on. It just means putting it somewhere in the system to to if it's. Um, a paddy turned on, and you specify a depth, that's all. You think you can figure it out, Cheryl? No, I think we need Dean to do that. <laughs> okay. That's yeah, a good because point. it's not the, you know, we're not opening the AppSim file and doing it through the GUI, we're, we need to do it through the translator. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, I, I uh, yeah. I, I had a question for Cheryl, talk, talk to Dean, um, but essentially it is your, um, your max bund height. That's that's what you're really looking at. Is if if you have a bund height of 300 millimeters, there's your max pond. There you catch it. Ah, so it's too shallow. A bund height of, of five centimeters allows water to be lost. Well, well, a five five centimeter bund height is is wrong. I would have I'll argue. Um, uh, it's. I don't, I've never seen a bun height of five centimeters. <laughs> Sorry. So let's let's uh, try a little bit of that, Cheryl. I had a question from one person, Andre Nikum. What's the reason for so much variability in AppStem? At least on the rainfall response, it's because it's a water limited aerobic, is what I would describe on this graph. Okay. Let me jump, let's see where my mouse is. Okay, here's nitrogen response between the two models. This one is different. The, this is AppSim. Uh, the series rise shows a tremendous nitrogen response. And remember that I was telling you that there was very high initial nitrate ammonium. The series rice model has substantial volatilization of ammonium both either as urea fertilizer or uh, initial ammonium and I'm, I, I think there's something very different about how this responds because you had to keep putting up more fertilizer to get the response up. Uh, Ken, it's yes. Perry again. 
Look, that's all that is is the fact that that's a dry land situation. It's not a ponded situation. So if you pond, if you were to put, uh, turn ponding on there and put pond into the simulation, it would do exactly the same as as disat. It would you would actually uh, volatilize a lot of your fertilizer and it'd be lost through denitrification. So. Uh -huh. It's, so that's, the, that's so just a dry land situation. So in the, this case, the dry land situation doesn't lose the nitrogen. No, okay. not not it. It can be lost. There is some losses in the system, but not not like a true ponded system. So uh, it's you you might get not in the low rainfall end. You wouldn't get uh, leaching of of okay. uh, nitrate or anything. Good explanation. Um, and, and there'd so be no ammonia in the system. It'd be all all um, nitrate. Mm -hmm. Is that right, John? Probably because it nitrifies very quickly. But I'm not familiar with these rice systems. Well, no, it's it, it's a, forget it, rice, so. John. Treat it as a wheat system. Yeah. It's a dry. This is just an irrigated wheat crop. There is. Yeah. Oh, it's a wheat crop. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Well, yes. It, yes, it nitrifies very quickly, so it'll be nitrate. Yeah, I follow that. So in this case, we're not losing any nitrogen with APSEM with denitrification or volatilization because it's aerobic. That's that's correct. Yeah. yeah if you turn pond on, it would respond quite well. Hmm. Okay. Let's see if I have one other here. Let me show the Pakistani one, and then and then we'll probably stop. The, the Pakistani presentation is also rice wheat, and there are some issues with this not being uh, totally resolved because they simulated to a fixed harvest date. Uh, here's their probability of exceedance plot over 33 farms observed, green, uh, DSAT red, and APSIM yellow. This is for, I believe, yeah, wheat. Um, I would worry a little bit about Epsom showing a huge variability here among farms and, and try to understand why. Um, in this case, something else happened. The DSAT was way up on yield level and the Epsom was not. And I, I'm not so sure whether we have an answer for why that happened. This was at 30 kilos of N. And here's, I did, they didn't show an 80. Temperature response uh, showing something the same shape that we saw before with wheat. Uh, rainfall response, not much because it's irrigated. And here's a case where we think that the fertilizer application was not working. Okay, there's no response to nitrogen. So I want to leave it there just to say that Possibly there's an issue with with the, the version of the quad UI they used. Ken, which team is this? This is uh, Pakistan. Okay, there's there's also a rerun. If you look in the same folder, there's a rerun for that same team that and shows a response with nitrogen. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure I want to go there, but ah, they had ah, I should have found the rerun. Did, did the rerun show weed also? Our rice? Uh, no, it's just the wheat. Just the wheat. Uh, I get myself in trouble. That's okay. Let me stop there. Do we have any other questions about where we are? The other two teams. Uh, um, the other, there, there are two of the other teams that had surveys, yields, which were, were reasonable, but no CTWN. So let's ask whether we have questions that we can respond to. There's one question I have about the DISAT use of SLPF, yes. the fertility knob. Um, if, if users are going to use SLPF in a DISAT run, then they, they need to think about what that means for 
the APSIM comparison. Okay. Because that, that's a knob to reduce fertility responses, for example, but there's no such knob in, in APSIM. So they, if, if it's representing phosphorus, for example, a phosphorus constraint, then that would mean that the APSIM soil P module would need to be plugged in, for example. Okay. I agree with you. So that they need to be wary in using that for the DISAT run because it has implications for the comparison to APSIM. Yeah. We have the DSAT now does have phosphorus capability for peanut. Uh, they're working on it for sorghum. It does exist for maize. That would add the additional requirement for teams to come up with a good soil phosphorus test for, and, and here's the problem, they haven't tested the actual farmer's fields. It would need to be for soils for in the similar region. And Phosphorus is a fussy thing to simulate. Yes, it is very, very fussy. Yeah. Um, I, I guess my point there is, if if people are using SLPF to calibrate the to the farmer yield right. results, then then that's a complication. Yeah. I, I, I don't I, think it should be used in that instance. Yeah, uh, I agree. This was the point I made, I think, earlier about. Uh, seeing a little bit too much use of this for a non-legume. Yeah. With the legumes, um, we strictly mean this to mean something that's related to phosphorus or aluminum saturation, for example. Uh -huh. um, and, and that is the only way to bring something down because the model, the legume models basically can mostly fix nitrogen on demand. Yeah. The, for a non-legume, this is my hesitation about saying it don't push the, and this is for all the teams, you keep the SLPF relatively high for maize and sorghum and and work hard on the uh, stable carbon pool. Mm. Yeah, good point. And it should be, SLPF should be used only for a phosphorus aluminum saturation issue, which we, we know is a problem in West Africa. Yes. Um, but uh, those of you who are inclined to do it think you can find soil phosphorus tests could try that but it's it's a pretty rough thing to do so is xf could it be used in a similar way to reduce growth i mean it acts yeah, in a different yes, way that, that would in, in the aluminium toxicity example yes it, it could but what it does in um, addition to that cheryl is it reduces water uptake too yeah, I know it's a different mechanism, but it it could have a similar, you know, reduction in growth. Right. Yeah. Good point. I think that the the point I think Perry made earlier about the prior crop residue and the root residue, um, we gave some very ballpark values. If you didn't know. And if you have model simulations that say that you have very low productivity, then the carryover of root and prior crop residue to, to the next crop needs to be low also. So, so use that advice to, to set it down if you feel that's appropriate. There's a, there's a question in the chat or a comment from Dakshina Murthy. It says, I think we should first be sure about our calibration, then only can we go to CTWN tests. Absolutely. And in fact, you, you, don't go to, you don't go to the, you know, climate impact either until you know your calibration's working right. So you, you worry about your inputs. Uh, but on the other hand, CTWN can help you diagnose issues with your inputs as well. So it might be a kind of an iterative process. Okay, Bright is saying, do we use SLPF in the same way as SLPF? You must mean X, X, XF. XF. Uh, not exactly. Uh, they have different meanings because XF will reduce water uptake and SLPF will not. Okay. Mm. Uh, here's this little thing about some very approximate rules for setting the prior root residue. If you know you have a yield, let's just say that you have a yield of uh, 1,000 kilos. 
then your total biomass divide by 0.4 and what do you get here? 2400 and then 15% of that might be root. Uh, so it, it's model simulations over the long term and say I have so much residue and so much root and then and you also have issues with uh, animals removing the prior crop residue and how much decays before your season starts and so it's low. Any other questions? I'm really encouraged. I still see 20 people staying with us going past the hour. So, But I think this has been really good because what we've discussed is the idea about being sure you're right on the inputs, getting advice from APSIM, DSAP model experts on what should be there and that you get reasonable response to nitrogen water. Um, that one taken with a grain of salt because the models are different from each other. And then you move on into the, the uh, acclimation and impact assessments. So one question that occurs to me is, where do we, how do we go forward from here in terms of making sure we get, have all the inputs for DISAT and APSIM correct for our calibration? We need to have a timeline and a, and a, a method laid out to do that. Uh, shall we try to agree on one here? Well, I, I'm interested to know what's plausible. Um, doing it by email is one option and getting all the modelers together in a workshop would be one other option uh, because from my observation there's still a lot of learning to take place in terms of what are reasonable values for putting into to the models and um, it, it's it's a long long into the process and and we have still got many issues with the inputs um, let me ask Cheryl for advice here or or you know some of the Columbia, New York folks, what's the timeline on when they're wanting the first impact assessments to be completed? I'm sure they want some results by the February meeting in, in Senegal. Yeah, so everything is driven from the back end forward. So we need to look at what the stakeholder messages are at the end of the project and working backwards in time, that's the economic outputs, and then the crop models need to feed the economic models. So there's a there's a fairly short timeline, and I think by the meeting in Senegal in February, we already need to have, um, you know, we, we need to be far beyond the historical analyses and calibrations. So yes. um, I Maybe maybe this is a good question for some of the teams because they all in their work plans have timelines and I wonder, you know, at what point will you be or should you be by say February at the um, at the regional meeting? I'm thinking that we, we need to get the inputs to the different models sorted out by the end of November. <laughs> So that we can yeah, move on to the CTWN. Yeah, I think yeah. that's right. I, I think we're actually already beyond the point where this should have been, um, you know, should have been done. I, th I think realistically, we need to. That needs to be a pretty hard deadline of solving all the input questions. The yeah. end of November. Mm. So, Garrett, do you do you want to comment on that, on the timeline? Are you there, Garrett? Uh, yeah, I had to unmute myself, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, we set up very strict deadlines during the Victoria Falls meeting, but I'm still a little bit shocked to see that we're still facing issues on the inputs, including my own Pakistani team. So 
you might have to revisit those timelines because I agree if, if these inputs are not correct for the calibrations, then we cannot move forward. But I think one month is, is enough to at least make a really good effort at solving the things we've discussed today. Yeah, but I mean it's going to take some time or individually one-on-one -on -one to look at it. Yes. So everyone that's with the team, uh, please reach out to EPSIM or DSAT modelers to ask your questions. So I think we already lost some of the people on the on the call here, so we might have to come out of some yeah. action items which need to be distributed to all the teams. Yeah, we've lost four, but that's that's not bad. Yeah, no, we've lost the India teams already. I think that's a good suggestion, though. I think what we should do is maybe set up another webinar and between now and that next webinar work individually with people by email, Skype. Um, we can we have the use of this go to meeting. So um, you're suggesting another webinar by the end of November, early December? Well, that gives us a deadline, right? Yeah. So it, I, I think that might be a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, Peter here, I agree with that, Cheryl. Okay. So maybe um, Monday or Tuesday, November twenty third or twenty fourth would might work. I, I can do that that week period. That's the Thanksgiving weekend for us. So. Well, it's early in the week this before is the Thanksgiving. Monday Tuesday prior to that. What would a Tuesday work like for that? No, November the 24th, you mean? Yes. Yep. It would probably be the 23rd if we can hold it again at sort of early morning US time. It would be the same day for us. 24th, Tuesday 24th. Sorry, John. Twenty third is a Monday. Twenty fourth is Tuesday. So, what day are you referring to, John, uh, Peter? I, I was referring to Tuesday, oh, the twenty fourth. Sorry, I just thought. Yeah. Yeah. And I was getting uh, caught thinking about the crossing the date line, but you know. But I don't think it's time US and no, not in this case. Yeah. If we have it, the same yeah. starting time. At the same time. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So Tuesday morning, twenty eighth. I mean the twenty fourth. Eight o'clock would work. Yeah, let's let's lock that one in. If there's no yeah, right on. Sherry says that date's on the calendar. She's putting it in. Okay. Any other objections from the seventeen people who are online? Garrett doesn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't get any sleep. <laughs> Just know that maybe we got to be resetting our clock on this weekend, so there might still be some time changes with everybody else was not resetting the clock. The rest of the world doesn't change, but we'll change times, yeah. but that's all right. Everybody's getting responses, so let's let's try to make that Tuesday, 24th of November. It'll be Eastern Standard Time, New York, then. Yep. And in the meantime, we'll just try to keep the the lines of communication open through emails and so on, and we'll try to, um, you know, get more feedback to people and and uh, let everybody ask specific questions to the, both the DSAT and the APSIM teams. There's there's a few questions that Cheryl and I discovered with individual DSAT file access that we need to let a few of you know. We've corresponded with some but not everybody. Okay, are we concluded? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, this has been great. I, uh, we needed to do this. Yep. I, I hope it was worthwhile for the, for the uh, regional teams. Sorry, we've, some of you have not been able to hear very well with Dilly's and we'll have to figure out why the voice is not coming across but uh, text box
works. Okay, thank you all. And thank, thank you, Ken. Everybody. Okay, thanks, thanks Cheryl. Yeah, bye. Bye. Yeah, thanks, Ken and Cheryl. Yeah. Thank